Welcome to Praise Hands, home of the Praise Hands, where we are all about creative, cross-cultural Christianity. I'm your host, Robbie Valderrama, and this is the last episode of Season 2. Today's episode was filmed live at the Baltimore, Maryland airport, where I had the chance to sit down with Angie K. Hong. In addition to studying at Duke Divinity School, Angie is a convener, a sought-after voice on issues of church and culture, and a worship leader with experience on staff everywhere from new church plants to megachurch pioneer Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago. Before we head on into this show, I want to invite you to join our year-end giving campaign. We launched it on Giving Tuesday and have already raised over $1,800 towards our $5,000 goal. In my experience, there are people doing fabulous work in issues relating to church, race, music, and economics. But until recently, there has been an enormous deficit of interdisciplinary conversation bringing these topics together to create meaningful solutions. And that's where Praise Hands has stepped in. If you believe in this vision of creative cross-cultural Christianity, I'd love to invite you to donate to our 501c3 and help fund this important work. All donors will receive access to an exclusive video call, which I'll share more about after the show. You can learn more and donate at praisehands.com. Now that we've covered all that, I think it's time for today's show. Enjoy. Angie, how's it going? It's going well. How are you? I'm doing great. So there's a lot, a lot of different directions we can go with this conversation. Yeah. I think what I'm excited for our listeners to hear from you mm-hmm. is really your perspective on, in particular, the multi-ethnic church, as well as where you see the future of multicultural worship going. Before we do that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself for, <laughs> for, uh, for our listeners? Yes, I can. So... I am a mother and I'm currently a student at Duke Divinity School. I'm getting a Master's of Divinity. Before that, I worked in um, several churches as a worship leader, a pianist, a music director, and most recently I was a creative director at Willow Creek uh, Chicago campus. So I've had sort of a range of experiences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My start to this whole notion of diversity around worship came as a result of being involved with Duke Center for Reconciliation, okay. uh, their annual conference okay. on reconciliation. So I was tapped to do worship for that, to lead worship and to create liturgy. Okay. And through that is how I became very spiritually formed by the theology of reconciliation. Mm. And through that, we created these liturgies of reconciliation. And these are people from all around the world. And I knew that my voice would not carry all these other voices that were in the room. So Mm. I just pulled together this ragtag band. Mm -hmm. And then it became an official band after that. So we were just sort of groping in the dark. But we were always went back to the theology of reconciliation mm-hmm. and what that meant for us mm-hmm. and for our worship leading. Yeah. So that's sort of my introduction. Yeah. So when you say theology of reconciliation, can you unpack mm-hmm. that for us? The theology of reconciliation, as is defined by the Duke Center for Reconciliation, was defined by a theologian, Emmanuel Katangale, okay. and uh, a practitioner, Chris Rice. Okay. Chris Rice has a has a background working in Jackson, Mississippi with John Perkins' son. They lived in community together. He is a white male. And Emmanuel Kentakle is from, I want to say Kenya, but is a theologian that was at Duke, I think now at Yale. So they together sort of wrote this book called Reconciling All Things, which outlines the theology of reconciliation. The first phase is uh, new creation. Okay. The second is lament over sin starting from the Garden of Eden till now and in the future. The third is moving into hope. Okay. The fourth moves into leadership. Okay. And then the fifth is about spirituality for the long haul. What are the tools that you need on your journey? Okay. Okay. So we created liturgies for every single day. Every single day was dedicated to a different theme. Okay. So if you can imagine dedicating a full day of laments. Awesome. No, that's great. I hadn't heard that specific framework before. So you got involved with that reconciliatory work, Mm -hmm. developing liturgy, which for people who might not be familiar with that term, essentially that's another word for worship. Yes, worship services, worship experiences, engaging the senses through music, through speaking and preaching, through the arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was great. Oh, that's awesome. So after this project that you did with Duke, you became involved with multi-ethnic church planning. Yes. Want to tell us a little bit about that? Yes. 
Well, at the time, so Durham, North Carolina was one of the only cities that wasn't as impacted by the 2008 recession. Mm, Because of that, people were pouring into the city to find better jobs. We have a lot of tech jobs available. We're the number one city for the creative class. I don't even know fully what that means. Because of that, there are so many pastors who wanted to plant churches for this growing community. Sure, sure. And most of these churches really sought to be multi-ethnic, very diverse church okay. plants. They saw this as a new beginning okay, to okay. create something new yeah. and, and diverse mm-hmm. to reflect the growing diversity of Durham. Mm-hmm. They were very well-meaning, mm-hmm. mostly white pastors mm-hmm. who had this vision of this Revelation 7, 8, 9, 21, and 22 and wanted sort of all kingdoms, tribes, nations mm-hmm. reflected. And so because of that, I got hired a lot to be sort of that mm-hmm. change agent. You're Korean-American? Yes. Okay. So I became sort of the diversity hire. Okay. So later on, I went through a phase of two or three churches, actually, that okay. were trying to do this. Okay. Out of that, the one church that I stuck with was the only church that actually created a multi-ethnic church. Mm. All the other churches became white. Okay. Because okay. there were certain systems that were just not wanting to... Why, why do you think that is that some churches ended up becoming white, whereas the third one actually yeah. became multi-ethnic? What was the difference? I have a lot of different theories, but I think it was that lack of cultural intelligence or humility okay. to learn okay. from different people about things like leadership structures, conflict resolution, okay. worship practices. And mm-hmm. I'm not just talking about music. I'm talking about styles of prayer, mm-hmm. styles of preaching. Okay. So all those really were not very fluid as okay. they thought they were Mm. and so because of that it just sort of fizzled out okay yeah and leadership was largely white as well so that third church what was your experience there what were some of the the joys of that season of ministry so the difference with this church i helped to plant it it is a small united methodist church just started out as a new faith community an innovative church planting effort by the umc okay so they sort of give you more creative reign Mm -hmm. over your staff even your pastors and so because of that our white pastor chose to really humble himself and Mm -hmm. listen to different voices okay then soon sort of rubbed up against this idea of like culture involving race and how it Mm -hmm. intersects. And Mm -hmm. we're in the South. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is very prevalent, Mm -hmm. especially amongst white and black people, Mm -hmm. the white and black binary. So he engaged in things like anti-racist training, uh, racial equity training, and was committed to this vision and really wanted to learn from his brothers and sisters of color, deferring his leadership, giving his power away. And I really do think that that is one of the reasons why that church is is very diverse, yeah. became very diverse. Yeah. Let's talk for a second about power. In Andy Crouch's book, Culture Making, he talks about the three elements of power, money, and sex. And he says, you always know how much money you have. You mm-hmm. always know how much sex you have. Mm-hmm. You don't know how much power you have. Mm-hmm. How significant do you think it is for people in leadership to be sharing their power with others? And how have you seen that done in a healthy way? Because it is okay for some power to exist. Otherwise, there's no order. Mm-hmm. But, but how have you seen that done in a healthy way? I think the best example, hands down, is Jesus himself, mm. who humbled himself mm-hmm. and really descended down yeah. to us. Yeah existed among us, Mm -hmm. showed us grace, mercy, and compassion when he didn't really have to. I mean, he's God. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And and we're not. And humiliated himself enough to the point of humiliation on the cross. His crucifixion was a process. It's a crucifixion process of death. Mm -hmm. It's not just like this one thing and you're done. It was walking through the streets humiliated, jeered at, like crown of thorns. I mean, it was was to that degree. Gave his power away. I like to think of it as create an environment where you have a gyrus and you have a bleeding woman, but they have equitable access to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm, And gyrus being fully aware of his privilege, even Mm -hmm. though he had a dying daughter, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. allowed himself to be patient and listen to this bleeding woman's story as Jesus wanted to hear her story. He turned toward her, heard her in in the whole crowd. Yeah felt her in the whole crowd and Jairus was there, patient, yeah. waiting his turn. Mm-hmm. And because Jesus was the source of ultimate power, it wasn't zero sum. Exactly. Yes. 
Yes. I just love how Jesus confounds like this upside down sort of kingdom thing. Mm-hmm. I, I love it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> just, so in, in addition to being involved with a couple of multi-ethnic church plants and yeah. being involved with the worship there, you also were in a creative role at Willow Creek Church in the Chicago area. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about um, your experience making that transition? You know, what were some differences and mm-hmm. what was that experience like for you? Yeah, I had done a few national projects okay. and leading worship. So I led worship at a Christian Community Development Association. And another uh, conference I led worship at was the Justice Conference. Okay. The Justice Conference had just moved to Chicago. Okay. And uh, I was a part of that team and it was in, in partnership with Willow. Okay. So that's kind of how I got introduced to some people at Willow. Okay. So when I moved to Chicago, mm-hmm. I was sort of recruited by them because they had okay. heard that I moved into town okay, and I okay. hadn't had a job lined up, okay, okay. unfortunately, but they reached out yeah. and I really felt, even though mega church was, I had never been in a uh-huh, mega church uh-huh. work setting before, yeah. I really felt that God was really calling me to mm-hmm. experience mm-hmm. that for whatever reason, mm-hmm. but I was just really opening, opening myself up to what God had in store mm-hmm. for me mm-hmm. working there. Yeah. And Although Willow and these small church plants, multi-ethnic church plants, were very different, one thing that they both tried to do was incorporate multiculturalism, mm. multicultural worship in that. And, and so I got to be a part of that and look through it through the lens of those two different yeah. churches, which yeah. is something really unique, I think, mm. that I have as a part of my story. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in both cases, their approaches to mm-hmm. multicultural worship and integrating that, the same really? strategies okay. were used. There were three main strategies. Okay. The first was to hire a person of color okay. to be sort of the, the presence on the stage, okay. and that would bring the diversity. Okay. And I think Tim Keller actually has a really famous story that you know he wasn't meaning for this to happen, but he had hired a, an Asian pianist, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden their congregation was like 20% Asian mm-hmm. before he knew it. And so it's sort of that same concept mm-hmm. of just the appearance. Mm-hmm. But with that, you have questions of like, well, is that really a culture change or is that a look? You know, is that tokenism Tokenism. involved? Mm -hmm. The second strategy was to have different languages. Mm. So singing in Spanish, singing in Swahili, because they're the easier ones. Sometimes you would throw in a little Mandarin. Mm -hmm. But with that, it's it's really hard to kind of go into more complicated words. Mm -hmm. And also, there's a lot of resistance from Mm -hmm. the congregation Mm -hmm. to sing it because they can't pronounce it. And people Mm -hmm. want to feel confident in singing. Mm -hmm. And also, if the worship leader doesn't really know how to speak the language Mm -hmm. or know anything about the culture, Mm -hmm. what is that, Mm -hmm. right? It's Mm -hmm. sort of another form of tokenism. And then the third strategy is to change up the styles of music. So having a gospel song a jazz mm-hmm. song, then a hymn, then mm-hmm. a classical. And that is very good in theory because it presents sort of like a musical array of things. Mm-hmm. But I don't know many professional musicians mm-hmm. that can play all styles of music mm-hmm. really, really well. Mm-hmm. And so you would have these worship teams that would try to execute these things musically. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have a hired, if you don't have the money to do it, mm-hmm. it's just very, very hard to do. Mm-hmm. All of that places a lot of unfair pressure on the worship leader to create that Mm -hmm, change. mm -hmm. And I think after experiencing it for many, many times, I realized, wow, this is an injustice on the worship leader. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's just not fair. And then when they don't deliver the goods, Mm -hmm. when the, when the congregation doesn't magically. It's like asking the pastor, Hey, like we want you to preach like a third of your sermon. in Yes. (laughs) Yes. And many of these worship leaders that have no theological training, Mm -hmm. no social or cultural intelligence training or, or anything pastoral Mm -hmm. leadership wise training, they're just sort of left to do this by themselves. Mm-hmm. And often they feel lonely and isolated. Mm-hmm. They don't have anybody to talk to because there's no other people of mm-hmm. color. Mm-hmm. So I think worship leaders have a very unique perspective on this mm-hmm. attempt yeah. for multiculturalism. Yeah. And so looking at it through that lens, I kind of had to go deeper, right? Because it, it isn't about different languages because I saw that and it, mm-hmm. a church still felt like it was majority culture. Mm-hmm. Hiring one person of color, that seems like a tokenism Mm -hmm. sort of thing because they weren't affecting anything else. Mm -hmm. And then you have the um, different musical styles, which is just really hard to execute. Sure, sure. And Mm -hmm. execute well. So I started to really look deeper into things like, okay, maybe it's about leadership structure. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to have more leaders of color. Mm -hmm. Um, 
or maybe we just need to increase our cultural intelligence mm. and learning how to do things cross-culturally. Mm. But I feel like that still sort of wasn't enough because I feel like there are lots of organizations that are trying to do that. Like the whole world is trying yeah. to do that right now. Businesses yeah. are trying to do yeah. that. And they're doing it well, actually, because mm -hmm. there's experts that mm -hmm. know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, like, what is unique about the church and yeah. the space? Yeah. What What is it about us, you know, about desegregating the most segregated hour mm -hmm. that we can do? And so then I started to really think about incorporating the Bible, of course, and th different theologies, because I can talk all I want about your food and your hair mm -hmm. or whatever. But if I also discount or don't seem valid the way that you see God, learn about God and know about God intrinsically, mm -hmm. then what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. That, you know, all we're trying to do is get along. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that for me is sort of what gets me excited about some sort of next steps for this mm -hmm. multicultural mm -hmm. worship leaders movement. Mm -hmm. By theology, I mean two different kinds. The first is primary theology, where you have this direct encounter with God, mm -hmm. um, Bible, mm -hmm. uh, Jesus, Bible, pray, you know, mm -hmm. sort of these simple, mm -hmm. like simple, but not simplistic, mm -hmm. you know, just these truths that you know. Sure. And what I found with that is that everybody's primary theology is the way that they see all of theology. Mm -hmm. So the way that I know God is the way that everybody should know God. Mm -hmm. um, that's called religiously powered ethnocentrism. Mm -hmm. The secondary theology, so there's the primary theology, the secondary theology is talk about God, mm. like learning, teaching about God. Like, like secondhand smoke. Yeah. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's, ooh, that's good. So, um, yeah, secondhand smoke about God. So, so your, your discourse about God, about, about theological concepts mm -hmm. like reconciliation mm -hmm. or theological concepts about diversity and talking about revelation and heaven and all these different things, mm -hmm. that's sort of a secondary theology. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, I feel like there is some need for us to think about getting out of our religiously powered ethnocentrism and looking at different theologies that come from different experiences mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and thinking of those as that is valid theology because the theology that I learned came from a specific experience too. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Sometimes has nothing to do with me, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I've been really encouraged by studying sort of liberative theologies coming out of Central America. How mm -hmm. do you tell a poor person who has no chance of getting, life will not get better. Mm -hmm. How do you tell them that God loves them? Yeah, yeah. How do they understand the love of God in a way that I never could? Right. Yeah. Right. So going deeper into that, understanding not just how they behave and like their culture, but how do they see God? And I think that that is sort of what I'm thinking, what I'm hoping is the next iteration of yeah. this multicultural worshiping thing. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's powerful. I think one of my friends has said, if your theology is more true for you in your comfortable American lifestyle mm. than it is for someone in a third world country that doesn't have access to the same material goods that you do. Mm. You may not have gone deep enough in your theological pursuit. Mm, wow, that's very powerful. I mean, this is what Martin Luther did, right? Mm. Nothing against Catholic, this is just sort of history what happened. Mm. His realization was everything's in Latin, mm -hmm. people don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a hierarchy mm -hmm. to like getting to know Christ. There's mm -hmm. this hierarchy. You have to go, go through all these steps, like mm -hmm. learn languages and catechisms and all mm -hmm. this stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he made it accessible. He translated things into German. He used vernacular mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. in the liturgies that he created mm -hmm. and worship services right. that he created. Then he used these songs that were sort of popular mm -hmm. at the time mm -hmm. and put different words to it, sort of making it. Yeah translatable for the people yeah. and so that they could have this direct encounter with God because right. they, they didn't know God like that. Mm -hmm. Like they, they couldn't, yeah. you know? I think that's really one of the keys is this question of access mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how are we creating spaces where people can access God and yeah. not that people can't access God wherever they're at, mm -hmm. but when we divide ourselves, whether it's racially or politically or these different ways, we put cultural fences around the family of God. Mm -hmm. We don't want to communicate explicitly or implicitly that one culture will come from is somehow like higher up on the chain towards God. Yeah. And I've, I've given this illustration on, mm -hmm. I think it was the episode with, with Tapestry Church earlier this season. Our daughters 
they can see things that I can't at their height. Right. And they can uh, they can observe things and say, hey, I found this. Oh, mm. I never even saw that. I was looking right. for that. But they were at that perspective. And so even scenarios that we might perceive mm. as being less esteemed by the world mm. unlocks things for us. I think what's really hard about that, though, is this religiously powered ethnocentrism. Mm. People have said to me, like, why can't we just focus on the Bible and Jesus? Mm. Like, why are we talking about things like social justice or mm. reconciliation mm. or you know, climate change or, or whatnot. Why can't we just focus on the Bible? And I think that's because like, thinking of that as theological work, uh, as biblical work, mm -hmm. as incorporated into the Bible, mm -hmm. is against sort of like how they learned, how people have learned about God. Mm -hmm. And to take away that shakes their foundation mm -hmm. of their faith. Mm -hmm. And of course you wouldn't want that, you know, you'd want to hold on to like foundation of what right. is true. Right. But I think it's becoming harder and harder to find out like what is true for you is right. maybe a different way that I learned it. Right, right. And it's it's kind of this tension of there's what I would call like cultural egalitarianism, which means yeah. that every part of every culture is just as valid, which referencing like the Nairobi statement of culture and worship part of the gospel is going to be offensive to some part of every culture. It's not going to be yeah. perfectly synced up because sure. we're not there yet. Yeah. So I think it comes down to this question of what does gospel redemption look like for every culture? Yeah. So let's talk for a second about yes. this, this conference that you and I just both got to go to. Yes. So fun. Calvin Institute of Christian <laughs> Worship. Uh, and you helped organize it as well. And it was a convening of multicultural worship scholars and practitioners from across the United States and even Canada, and really asking this question of what is the history of the multicultural worship movement mm -hmm. as well as what is the path forward? So I'm, I'm thinking maybe we can chat through some of the highlights, maybe some takeaways you had from it, some takeaways I had, because really this is the tip of the spear. This is the most current conversation fresh. on this topic very fresh. very fresh literally yeah. like today is yeah. when the conference <laughs> yeah. ended so yeah. if people want to know what's going on with multicultural worship this is a really significant source of, yeah. of data for them yes i was having several conversations with my colleague adam perez about multicultural worship he is an academic through and through <laughs> and i was coming from a practitioner perspective mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so we were talking about things like what's the difference in multicultural worship versus cosmopolitanism versus globalization versus mm -hmm you know, all these different things and like, what's wrong with like people projecting their own dreams onto the eschaton and, you know, all these like- Normal questions that people weird, talk to every day. I know, <laughs> weird things that only he yeah. and I be right, excited right, right, about right. at our whole school. Yeah. So, um, so we were talking it out and I was like, you know, we really mm -hmm. need to ask this of the people that have been doing this practice. How cool would it be to mm -hmm. interview and to get all these different thoughts yeah. about multicultural worship right. in the room and yeah. just have really robust and good conversation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what if we got academics and practitioners together yeah. that are just beyond us, mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. major markers in the movement? So that's kind of how we got partnered with Calvin to mm -hmm. sort of pull off this, this mm -hmm. one-time consultation mm -hmm. and see the evolution of thoughts. The other mm -hmm. thing is a lot of this published stuff, it's not that recent they were mm -hmm. almost like 10 years ago mm -hmm. right. so they have had to have evolved especially after 2016 right so what are they thinking right now and mm -hmm. how can we now have these great conversations all in the same room mm -hmm. and where do we go from here yeah and that's what this gathering was about right so you just heard this evolution of ideas the timeline was great because mm -hmm. you yeah. know we, we were thinking back to history major milestones in history right. we basically plotted out all right what what have been the highlights yeah. in this concept of not just the worship movement, but also in broader culture and kind of the intersection of those. Yeah. We plotted out with post-it notes all over the wall and said, in the last 30 years, what have been some of the highlights? What are the trends? Yeah. And maybe we can talk through just that okay. trend line for a yeah. second. What trends stuck out to you from that timeline uh, of the past? Oh, so much. Well, like things that happened in all sorts of music, Kirk Franklin mm -hmm. and his crossover into pop music mm -hmm. um, in the 90s, I think was a major milestone for the black church, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So hearing that perspective, mm -hmm. I mean, I just thought it sounded amazing, mm -hmm. but for them, it was like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Yeah, we yeah. got secular artists and it right. sounds like R&B, it yeah. sounds too secular. So that, and then things like Asusa Street Revival. Mm -hmm. And then of course you got to document Hillsong, mm -hmm. the rise of CCLI. Right. I actually don't totally know the history, but basically you had integrity signing on people 
like Ron Canoli as well as Hillsong. And then eventually they got bought up by David C. Cook a number of years later. Okay. Uh, But throughout that whole process, that was shaping the sound of the modern praise and worship movement. Yeah. So those are some cool milestones to sort of look Mm -hmm. at. And of course, we talked about Kanye, Mm -hmm. early 2000s Kanye and today Kanye. Right. We talked about Kendrick Lamar's contribution to protest songs, which Mm -hmm. became very important around the mid 2010s and on. Mm -hmm. So his musical things. We also talked about LA riots. Mm -hmm. We talked about things in history. Right. I think I think we also talked about like things like September 11th. Yes. uh, The the attacks. The war. And and really how suspicion Mm -hmm. entered in a new way to the American dialogue. And Mm -hmm. it really kind of forced a conversation about how we felt about people that didn't look like us, particularly Middle Easterners. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of really interesting elements that I think That's have right. brought us to this moment yeah. where we are today. Mm. And then we also talked about what we see as really the future yeah. of multicultural worship. And maybe we can talk through some of the really interesting ideas that were put out. Yeah. So after we built that timeline of the past, on the very last day, we wanted to build out that timeline for the future, Mm -hmm. which we really should have had more time to do it. There's so much excitement around it and some really collaborative opportunities. But there was sort of a group that you were in this group Mm -hmm. that was looking at distribution Mm -hmm. and how to, I mean, you put it very beautifully, actually. So I'll have you explain that. Yeah. So basically we were talking about how do we bring systemic change? How do we take a lot of these movements that are doing great things in little pockets that are not even showing up as a blip on the radar of Mm -hmm. what Christian art and Christian music is? Mm -hmm. How do we bring these together and achieve some critical mass? And specifically looking at the system of the music of the church with the Christian music industry and different things like that. There's nothing wrong with having the music that we do within the Christian music industry, but that narrow of a definition of the music of the church is something that unnecessarily excludes a lot of people. So the question becomes, how do we create a commercial engine that can really coexist with that, that rather than having multi-ethnic worship expressions that get consumed or erased by the CCM movement, what if there was some critical mass towards these movements that really songs were able to be shared, it's able to synergize, yeah. publicize, and, and even monetize the multicultural worship movement. So yeah. that, that, I think, was one of the ideas that a lot of people were rallying behind. Right. So if you're listening to this and you're a multicultural worship leader or in multi-ethnic ministry um, and want to collaborate, I mean, let us know. E- you know, Email us, go to praiseyands.com, get in touch, or reach out on social media because there's a lot brewing and I'm excited to see what happens from here in the multicultural worship movement. Well, so, so Angie, how can people learn more about what you're doing and follow your work? Yes, you can follow me on all platforms at Angie K. Hong, A-N-G-I-E-K-A-Y-H-O-N-G. I'm most active on Instagram, no lie. <laughs> I also have a website, AngieKHong.com, which I do some blogging and some other sorts of stuff. And then I'll be blogging pretty regularly on Missio Alliance, which is a equipping the church sort of mm-hmm. platform mm-hmm. about this. And yeah. I'm just around. Yeah. Well, (laughs) Angie, I appreciate your work in convening leaders like myself and these other people that are in these pockets and bringing everybody together for these important conversations. And I love the role that you're playing. And I I feel Mm -hmm. it's a really crucial role in bringing together the church Mm -hmm. in this topic. So thank you. Thank you for having me. This podcast is awesome, (laughs) y'all. Thanks for tuning in, friends. If you would like to ask questions about this recent multicultural worship leadership group that Angie and I were talking about, I would love to invite you to an exclusive group video call where I'll share an insider's view that you won't find anywhere else. Anyone who contributes to our 2019 year-end giving campaign, as well as our monthly support team, will receive an invite to this call. You can donate now at praisehands.com. Again, that's praisehands.com. Well, guys, it's hard to believe we're 25 episodes in and that season two is already done. We've talked through everything from virtual reality church to the U.S.-Mexico border situation to financially sustainable models of multicultural ministry and so much more. With all this, one of our favorite things is hearing from you, our listeners. We want to know, what challenged you this season? What moved your heart? And lastly, what feedback do you have for us? To get in touch, shoot us a note at praisehandspodcast at gmail.com. Thank you all for being such amazing listeners. We'll see you right back here next year for season three.